Hey there, welcome back. I'm Jeff Yee, and this is video number four of the Particles of the Universe series, and this one is on forces. All right, the definition of a force is something that causes a change in the motion of an object, such as gravity. Or another one is magnetism. Those are forces. And this is a really good example to illustrate that magnetism is stronger than gravity, otherwise the balls at the end here would be dropping to the ground. So magnetism is stronger than gravity, but there's another one that's even stronger, which is the strong force. Last time I showed an illustration of this being an atomic nucleus of protons and neutrons together, and they're held together by the strong force. And the question is, what makes up all of these forces, and why do they exist? And that's what we're going to explore today, and I think you're going to be really interested in the explanation for gravity. Two quick reminders before starting the video. The first is that all the information in this presentation is available in both the books and on the website in the URLs you see. And the second is I will cover blue slides in detail, and red slides you can pause at any time to read such as this one, which covers the wave constants and variables that will be used in the presentation. All right, so forces, and explaining forces that cause the motion of objects. Now, if energy flows as waves and particles move to minimize wave amplitude, which was covered in previous sections, then four forces, electric, magnetic, gravitational, and strong forces can all be unified and they can be explained as a difference in wave type or formation. And I realize the weak force was left out, and it'll be explained why later. Forces are really nothing more than wave centers minimizing their amplitude, which is why particles prefer the node of a standing wave. In the bottom, you see a change in amplitude on the right, a bigger amplitude uh, wave forces the wave center, in this case, to the left, designated by the yellow arrow. And the top one is no force. And you'll see R standing for radius, the distance between two particles, and R particle being the radius of the particle. That and the change in energy, which is really just the change in amplitude, are the key variables that are required to be able to determine the force. Wave interference. Before we get into the electric force, it's important to understand constructive wave interference. Two particles in the same wave phase will be constructive, and that means that wave amplitude will increase. Waves that are antiphase, if they are uh, 180 degrees separated phase on the wave, they produce destructive wave interference. It'd be similar to Two waves colliding where one is at the peak and the other is at the trough, they combine to basically have no wave at all. And that's destructive wave interference. Now, remember this property of waves. And by the way, this is seen throughout nature, constructive wave interference. Sound waves, for example. That's how noise cancellation headsets work. The electric force really is just that. It is constructive wave interference between a group of particles separated at a distance of r. And so here a letter has been given q to be the count of particles. Now letter q is already used today in electric force, although it's typically used with a lowercase q. In this case, the same letter is used with an uppercase uh, because it's uh, being used as a numeric count as opposed to a charge. Charge is no longer necessary, it's wave amplitude. And so here is Q as one of the variables that's used. But again, skipping over this because it's a red slide. This is another red slide. Um, pause on this at any time. But this is the derivation of a critical equation known as the force equation. Pause here if you want to see the derivation. But this is how to derive Coulomb's law and the Coulomb's constant from the force equation. And here, four more properties of the um, fundamental physical constants 
used in physics, elementary charge, Coulomb constant, electric constant, and magnetic constant are derived entirely by wave constants. So 19 constants simplified, we'll eventually get to 19, simplified by nothing more than four wave constants plus one that is for the electron, for a total of five. Now using a new equation, the force equation uh, requires uh, proof, and that proof is in uh, matching experiments. Again, a red slide, so I am going quickly through red slides, but please pause if you want to see any of these details. All right, back to a blue slide where I'll spend my time explaining it. And again, pause at any time if you want to see the details and the mathematical proof. Now acceleration, or F equals ma, Newton's, the basis of Newton's second law. Acceleration is simply the movement of that particle adjusting to wave amplitude, the force. And it can be represented, again, in wave uh, constants, as you see below. A stands for acceleration. And here is calculations using that equation for acceleration, uh, calculating surface gravity of planets. This was a fun one, which is now deriving Newton's law from the force equation. Velocity. Velocity is very similar to acceleration. With velocity, the important thing to understand here is a change in wavelength. As a particle moves, it will adjust its wavelength. It uh, happens in waves, sound waves, electromagnetic waves all the time, and it's modeled using Doppler equations. So from here we can get to a velocity equation, um, but we will come back to this change in wavelength and how it affects uh, length contraction as well as time dilation in relativity. And in relativity, uh, this factor is, is used, it's called the Lorentz factor, and it can be derived based on this change in wavelength as a particle moves. And as it moves, it's really the standing waves within the particle's radius that is experiencing the change in wavelength. And to calculate it, it's actually the geometric mean of what's called the leading edge and the lagging edge, the trailing, if you will, uh, wavelengths. And here is that derivation. It's a red slide, so I will skip over this, but hit pause if you want to see the details on how to derive it. Einstein's general relativity becomes apparent as well. Again, this is a red slide, so if you want to walk through the math, you're welcome to do so. But in the end here, you'll see some of the equations from general relativity. Back to a blue slide. So we've covered the force equation, which itself was derived from the longitudinal energy wave equation. So everything has its base in an energy wave equation, just one. It derives the force equation. And what we have done so far is now have mapped that to Coulomb's law and have also mapped it to Newton's second law. So we've tied all of this together so far for at least the electric force and Newton's F equals MA second law. But there's a lot more that needs to be unified other than just the electric force. And so the next stop is the magnetic force. And if you remember from the particles video, the electron was described as a combination of 10 wave centers, and at least one of those wave centers is continually off-node and repositions to be on the node, forcing another one to be off-node. And energy is always conserved, so the in wave, the longitudinal wave that comes in, that's reflected out, is equal to the energy coming out plus a new wave, which becomes the magnetic wave. And this is a transverse wave. It's a result of a wave center that is vibrating, continually spinning. And that transverse wave is the magnetic force. And how do we know this? Well, 
The electron has a property called the Bohr magneton, and that's the natural unit of the electron's magnetic moment. And what's interesting here is that the amplitude reduction is the coupling constant for gravity. And so that change in energy, that loss of amplitude, becomes the energy for magnetism, the Bohr magneton. And this is the gravity of electron coupling constant, that reduction in wave amplitude. It's a red slide, so I'll skip this quickly. And I'll skip over this one too, but just note that this is the derivation of the Bohr magneton, and there circled in red is the coupling constant for gravity as required in the derivation for the Bohr magneton, which is very interesting. But back to magnetism and the explanation of the electron as wave centers, a combination of wave centers spinning, where at least one is always off node and repositioning to the node, forcing another off node. And as it does this, it's spinning and creating a transverse wave that is axial. And that becomes the lines for magnetism. That's a single particle, but of course, with magnets, we typically see particles with opposite spin, and they cancel their waves, just like shown earlier in destructive wave interference, and that then produces a different type of uh, magnetic lines, as you see here on the bottom right. Okay, so how is all this related to gravity? Well, that same picture you see here again, which is the change in wave amplitude as the wave comes in and as it's reflected out, it loses a little bit of energy because the particle is spinning. And that energy is now transferred to magnetism. But that change in wave amplitude is the coupling constant for gravity. Now, we don't see this with particles today for an individual particle, and the reason is because the electric force always takes over. Constructive wave interference for two particles, like the electron, will become the force and will repel long before an attractive force of missing amplitude. But when protons combine with electrons to form an atom, it cancels that electric force. Now, if you have a combination of millions and millions and millions of these, i.e. A, a large body such as Earth or the Moon, then that amplitude difference can be summed up. Now you see the amplitude loss for an electron and for a proton, and you see the amplitude difference is really the sum of all of these different particles, electrons and protons, that are spinning, and that energy that's required, required to make them spin causes an amplitude loss. And, ne and then you see two particles or two large bodies that are attracted to each other because of that loss of amplitude, and they always move in the direction of minimal wave amplitude. Before we get into the actual calculations of uh, large bodies and gravity, uh, one quick explanation is particle mass ratios. So proton to electron mass ratio is calculated here in wave constants, and that's going to be used uh, later. But you also see Planck mass um, to electron and Planck mass to protons. The interesting thing about it is all of them are a combination uh, or a ratio, I should say, of amplitude to wavelength. Here we are back to large bodies and now an explanation of uh, two large bodies such as the Sun and the Earth. And as waves pass through these large bodies and it transfers to magnetic energy, right? The Earth has um, a magnetic core of iron. It is, uh, the out waves are reduced uh, for longitudinal waves and then the large bodies will be attracted to each other. It's otherwise known as a shading effect. And thus has been proven uh, in great detail, actually, taking that same force equation and deriving Newton's law of universal gravitation, which is used today for calculating gravity in the solar system. That's a red slide, so I'll pause here. You can walk through the details if you hit pause. Same here, so page two of the derivation, but you can see here the result is the force equation can derive Newton's law of universal gravitation.
And with that, it can also derive the gravitational constant, g. And it can derive it purely in terms of the same wave constants that are being used to derive all of the uh, fundamental, fundamental physical constants you see here. And it does so in both value and in units. But back to this, calculating large bodies with a single fundamental rule of wave centers moving to minimize amplitude and a single equation, the force equation. Um, the force equation uses a particle count Q. And so gravity is a little bit trickier than the other forces because large bodies like the Earth have a significant amount of particles. And the proton's amplitude loss is used because the proton is significantly uh, greater in mass than the electron, but it requires calculating the number of protons and electrons and neutrons in a large body. That's a red slide, so I won't go through the details. You can hit pause if you want to see how to do it, but this is a method of how to calculate the number of particles, or estimate, I should say, the number of particles such that the force equation can be used for gravity. And here are the calculations for uh, various planets, uh, Earth and Moon, Earth and Sun, in including particles, and a lot more has been calculated and is available for all the planets in the solar system. But it is uh, consistent with Newton's calculations using the law of uh, universal gravitation. And here is a force equation you know, using the uh, coupling constant for the proton, and it can be simplified, and so it was given a name, Simplified Gravitational Force Equation. All right, so this is strange. Gravity and magnetism are related, right? The loss of energy in the longitudinal wave becomes magnetism, and it creates an attractive force for gravity. So why is it that magnetism is so much stronger? And the answer is a change of wave types. Right, that longitudinal wave that now spinning becomes a transverse wave in an axial direction, and the gravitation is really an amplitude loss of that spherical longitudinal wave. And that is the primary difference of why the magnetic force is much stronger, and it's stronger at short distances, and then of course it decreases very rapidly with the cube of the distance, whereas gravity decreases with the square of the distance. Now that covers the electric force and magnetism and gravity. There's another force called the strong force, which is in the middle of atomic uh, nucleus. It binds protons and neutrons together, and it's also what binds the elements within the proton and the neutron called quarks. And back in the 1960s, a proton you know, was smashed together and found to consist of three quarks. And then more recently, in 2015, uh, a pentaquark was discovered. And a pentaquark is uh, five quarks, but it's a unique combination. It includes four quarks and an antiquark. And that model, the more recent discovery of the pentaquark, is significant. And it's used here in this theory to explain a lot of different things. And the first thing is the strong force. But... Since this is a very different model and a very different explanation of the proton, we need to explain it first. And so, back in the 1960s, when protons were smashed together and the standard model first came out with the three quark explanation, it's quite likely, if we, if we assume the proton is truly a pentaquark, that it looks something like this. Right? At lower energy, it split the three quarks, which, by the way, never completely you know, uh, disappear. It's like rubber bands. They stretch out. You can see them for a little bit, and they come back together again. But the other two, the anti-quark and the quark, would annihilate. You wouldn't be able to see them. So it truly would look like three quarks for a proton. But now, you know, decades later, particle accelerators have uh, invested in, in much higher energy. So imagine now something hurtling at a proton with tremendous energy and velocity. It smashes it, and not only do you see those three quarks, but it has enough energy to have that other quark, the fourth one, and the anti-quark split and fly away at such high velocities that they don't have time to annihilate. And I think that's why we see a pentaquark now. And if that truly is the structure of a pentaquark, it explains a lot, which we will cover not only here in this section, but in the next sections as well. 
But first, the proton also has spin and color, and that's addressed here. Um, if it, it's a quark or an electron, then it would have identical spins. Four of them would neutralize, leaving the fifth one to be uh, half spin uh, or minus half. And also color could be a combination of the different uh, results that you see for uh, the quarks. Now to explain the strong force, uh, it is a composite particle. If you look at um, uh, the proton or the neutron, and quarks would combine at high energies to be within one standing node a wavelength from each other. Right? This is a position, again, standing wave nodes are stable because it is the point of minimal amplitude. It's a unique property of uh, standing waves. Now normally, you know, so these particles would, um, if they're further from the particle radius where it's not standing waves, they would repel. So there has to be sufficient energy to be able to push them uh, together into a particle's radius such that they're within a standing wave um, node. Now when it happens, the amplitude increases significantly and it becomes the fine structure constant, or the inverse of, which is 137 times greater. And that's a strong force. It creates a gluon that keeps these two particles within the standing wavelength node. And this has been modeled in the force equation, the same force equation that's used for everything. And the only difference here is the uh, coupling constant for the change in wave amplitude that's appended to the force equation. So here's a red slide where you can see how uh, this has been simplified using that coupling constant to be the simplified strong force equation. And that's used, here's another red slide, so I won't cover this much, but it's the calculations here for the strong force and the nuclear force are consistent with the force equation and the distance for those standing wave nodes. But back to a blue slide and an explanation of the fine structure constant. All right, it's, it's seen as the coupling constant, uh, which is in this model a difference in wave amplitude. But here's the curious thing about it. The electron is used in the derivation of the fine structure constant in this theory. And it's actually in three places, the wave center count, the amplitude factor, and the mass. So it's entirely possible, because these are three components for the electron, it's entirely possible that a quark is highly energetic electrons. And it also makes sense in decay, which is coming up also in this section. But first, here's the derivation using those constants. And you can see that the fine structure constant is yet another fundamental physical constant that's derived exactly in value and in units. Well, in this case, there's no units, it's dimensionless because it's simply just a, a ratio of a change in wave amplitude. And so this is then plugged into that table, which is all the wave constants and variables that are used throughout this theory. Okay, but there's another nucleon, the neutron, that needs explanation. So if the proton is a pentaquark, what is a neutron? Well, if you add another electron to the neutron right in the middle, which by the way is about the mass of a neutron anyway, it's about um, it's a proton plus roughly an electron, it would annihilate with that center positron. Right? So that would give it its neutral charge. And now this becomes more sense. It makes a lot more sense when you take a look at what's called the weak force. And the weak force is a standard model force, but here in, in this theory, it's not really treated as a true force, um, which is a result of a change in, in wave amplitude. Instead, the weak force is a combination of the electric force and the strong force, which will be shown in the next slide. But first, an explanation of the results of neutron decay. This is what is seen when a neutron decays, it decays to be a proton, and there in the middle you see a pentaquark, and the two other particles that are ejected as a neutron decays is an electron and a neutrino. Let's do this one again. So if a neutrino, a solar neutrino, for example, coming from the sun, has sufficient energy and it strikes that middle electron, it can eject it. And this is exactly what is seen in neutron decay an electron and a neutron come from it, not quarks. 
So the neutron should have never, just like the proton, should have never been considered quarks in the first place. If decay results show something different. So red slide, so you can see just quickly the nuclear force and distance, um, but you also see again the neutron's explanation for beta minus decay and the particles that are as a result, but also the proton. And the proton can eject the positron, which is seen in beta plus decay, and just be an empty shell. It would appear with a neutral charge again, just like a neutron. You can see the masses here of uh, particles, again, further evidence of the proton and the neutron being pentaquark structures. So here, we'll finally wrap this up now. A summary of forces, right? All forces in this model, waves, the weak force is the exception, you know, for uh, the reasons I just noted. All of the forces, electric, magnetic, strong, and gravitational forces are a result of wave centers moving to minimize their wave amplitude. But it's a difference based on wave interference, constructive wave interference, or wave type. And so the first one is the electric force, right? It's longitudinal traveling waves and particles have constructive or destructive wave interference. And that same longitudinal wave was shown to calculate the electron's mass as a result of standing waves, and beyond that, traveling waves was uh, proven to derive the Coulomb constant. And gravity, as a particle like the electron spins, is simply a reduction in wave amplitude, and that was calculated to be the gravitational coupling constant, and proven also to derive Newton's universal law and the gravitational constant g. But that same energy loss as the particle like the electron is spinning becomes a transverse wave. And due to the conservation of energy, that same coupling constant was proven to derive the Bohr magneton, which is the magnetic moment of the electron. Then put two electrons not quarks, but put two electrons close together with significantly high energy so that it overcomes the repelling uh, factor. And at a standing wave node, now its standing wave amplitude will increase significantly and will become the, it's the fine structure constant. And this was proven, one, with strong force calculations, but it will also be proven again in the orbital section, separate video, for the Bohr radius and how it's related now to the atomic orbital distance where electron is from the nucleus. And that's it. A summary of forces all as wave centers moving to minimize amplitude. One fundamental rule, one equation, unified. Thanks for joining. That concludes the video on forces. And now that we know forces causes the motion of particles, we're going to talk about a particular type of motion, vibrational motion, and how it creates photons in the next video, number five.